fourth state of consciousness, the meditative state, samadhi. In the literature of yoga, there's the expression, the peaceful, the blissful, the undivided, non-dual, is thought to be the fourth. That is the self. That is to be known. It is not just a state of subjective experience. It has, in the brain, its corresponding measurable correlates. At every level of the settling of the mind, the electrical activity of the brain, the firing of the neurons in the brain looks completely different. Outwardly directed activity, active mind, concentration, focusing, quieter levels of self-reflection, as in, for example, what's called open monitoring, the scientific literature, but self-reflective, self-observing, Vipassana style meditation or mindfulness is generally in this category. Completely different style of functioning of the brain. Going beyond thought completely, now having nothing to do with thought, no mind, no intellect, but pure, unbounded, universal, abstract awareness. Pure existence has its own completely unique style of brain functioning. The meditative state is characterized by not just the frequency, which is alpha-1, but the uniform or synchronous firing across the total brain. And that's, from a brain standpoint, amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Because normally the brain is not that coherent, in case you can't tell. That in waking consciousness, even sitting restfully with the eyes closed, if you look at the electrodes on the scalp as you measure the electrical activity of the brain in waking consciousness, there's not a great deal of coherence or communication or correlation between different parts of the brain. Some neighboring parts of the brain are talking to each other, but mostly the brain is functioning in a rather asynchronous and chaotic way. This is the same subject, learn to meditate three months later in the meditative state, and you see something you don't see in hypnosis, waking, dreaming, sleeping, or drug-induced states. You see the whole brain functioning in a completely synchronous, coherent way. That is one of the signatures of a new state of consciousness. Fourth state of consciousness, samadhi, the meditative state. Now, in addition to simply being interesting, for practical purposes, orderly brain functioning is a good thing. It correlates with intelligence, and creativity, and learning ability, and moral reasoning, ego development, psychological stability and emotional maturity. And everything good about the brain depends on its orderly functioning. And when people experience samadhi regularly, you see marked improvements in every measure of human intelligence, highly significant improvements, which suggests that transcending is good for you. It's also very good for the health, but I won't go into that. Mm -hmm. Something real is happening, something very different is happening, something rather radical is going on in the meditative state, state of samadhi. But back to the first question, what is the relationship between that inner experience of unbounded awareness when the mind, the intellect is temporarily left behind? Because transcending can be a rather fleeting experience, as the Rosicrucians like to say, one split second in eternity. It's a holy shit experience. Oh my God, what was that? It's radical, but in its universal, and it's unbounded, and it's infinite. But what is the relationship between that field of intelligence within, at the basis of thought, and the intelligence at the basis of the universe, our Atma, our Self, the observer, the seer within, and Brahman, the unified source of the entire universe. A physicist might at first say, forget it. How could there be a relationship? Because this is purely subjective, and that is purely objective, material stuff. But at this conference, we probably know by now 
that quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, and the unified field are non-material realities. Absolutely non-material. It's not a material source of the material universe. It's a non-material source and pure potential, pure intelligence. And intelligence is a perfectly fair word because the deeper you go into nature and the more you explore the laws of nature, for example, at the level of electromagnetism, at the level of the Nobel Prize winning electroweak unified theory, grand unified theories, and super unified theories, the more concentrated the intelligence becomes. And the very simple mathematical formula that describes the structure and functioning of unity contains within that compact form all the intelligence, all the laws of nature governing life at every level. Maxwell's equations, and quantum chromodynamics, and the electroweak theory, and theory of general relativity, all of that is found in most concentrated form here. So the unified field is the most concentrated field of intelligence in nature, and dynamic intelligence. And dynamic intelligence is consciousness. And you can take that sort of qualitative relationship or discussion quite far. And philosophy, philosophers of, scientists, of science would love this dialogue. For a quantitative physicist or quantitative scientist, anything that could be related to semantics is not well trusted. So I'm going to touch upon arguments that you can sink your quantitative teeth into to establish the identity of our own inner intelligence and the intelligence at the basis of the universe. And I'll do this very quickly, but if we tape it, if you're interested, you could go back and try to make sense out of it. Quantitative correspondence between pure consciousness and the unified field. Let's look at them quantitatively, and what does that mean? Well, we have a unified field, but we also have its structure of vibrations, its calculable frequencies. And these fundamental frequencies, the natural reverberant tones of the unified field, just dial it down just a tiny bit, those frequencies of the unified field are the elementary particles and forces of nature. That's all they are. They're just the fundamental reverberant frequencies of unity. And we know what they are. This is the spin two graviton responsible for gravity, the spin one forces like electromagnetism, the nuclear force, the spin one half particles like electrons and quarks, the spin zero Higgs, which has finally been seen. All of these different vibrational tones of the unified field are well mapped, well known, and calculable. But what about consciousness? What emerges from the abstract field of consciousness is thought, physiology, matter. When the awareness settles in, all of that dissolves into pure being. But getting familiar with the process of emergence and submergence and emergence and convergence and emergence and submergence, you get you're familiar with the fundamental tones, the vibrations or waves of consciousness rising from pure silence into activity. And you can enumerate those waves, the fundamental frequencies of consciousness. And initially there are three as the pure knowledge, pure knower, pure consciousness is seen as the knower, but also that which is known, the object, and the dynamic relationship between the two. That is Satchitananda, that is the Holy Trinity, that's the three-in-one structure of unity. But the moment you have three, you automatically have the relationships among those three, and the number of relationships, well, what, skipping the mathematics and the group theory, there emerge really a total of eight entities from the three, including something that you can call in the Vedic literature, vata, pitta, and kapha, which means pertaining to ego, pertaining to intellect, pertaining to mind. And then the five fundamental elements, akasha, etc. You say, well, that's kind of a coincidence that you get this three-in-one emergence 
of this, from the ocean of unity, both from the self and from the superstring theory. And if you look at it, it really is a very striking structural and functional correspondence. Because both in the world of physics, in today's supersymmetric world, you have the five. Five spin types, the five fundamental categories of matter and energy responsible for the universe that are related to each other in these three doublets or these pairs, which unites, for example, the spin two with its nearest spin neighbor, spin three halves graviton, into one more holistic entity called the gravity superfield, and so forth. <coughs> But these five fundamental elements are also fundamental in the science of consciousness and what we see, feel emerging from the ocean of consciousness on a subjective level. This is what yoga is about. The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali are about experiencing the ocean of pure existence and then stimulating that ocean into waves of vibration and experiencing the fundamental building blocks of mind and creation. This is the Yoga Sutras. And these five elements, Akasha, etc., are bound together in exactly these pairings and only these pairings, which are called not, not superfields, but prakritis. And these are the you know, fundamental, most fundamental three ingredients of the universe. Now, and it's not just numerically, what are they? What is Akasha? What is gravity? Gravity is curved space. Gravity is purely a manifestation of the curvature of space. So space is not just nothing. It's a relativistic fluid. It curves and it flows, according to Einstein. But what is Akasha? Space. Not as nothing, but space is subtle substance. Space is relativistic fluid. And similarly with all of these, it's interesting because when people maybe hear about the five elements which you'll find in the Vedic literature and in the Chinese literature, the typical response of a modern scientist is to say, how quaint, how, how delightfully primitive. But after all these years of scientific exploration, we are back to the fundamental five, and they are the same five. So anyway, we have this correspondence between the vibrational expressions of consciousness into matter from the standpoint of conscious experience and the expression of the unified field into matter from the standpoint of modern physics. And that in itself is a striking, the likelihood that that's a pure statistical fluke is about one in a thousand. That's the sort of evidence physicists can actually appreciate. What I won't go into, but certainly am tempted to, it's not necessarily the right audience, is that in addition to the expressions of the unified field in creation, we can also look at the unified field before the Big Bang. Because the superstring theory, the ocean of the unified field wasn't created in the Big Bang. It created the Big Bang. It was there before the Big Bang. And so long before the universe, the unified field was contentedly sitting within itself, not dead, not lifeless, not inert, but pure life, a field of pure life, mm -hmm. reverberating within itself, mm -hmm. humming within itself. So we can say, well, let's ignore the surface emergence of the vibrations responsible for the particles of nature. Let's look at the internal life of the unified field, the so-called internal string modes. And without going in today to a huge rigmarole, which I love to do, the structure of the superstring is a series of harmonics of natural internal reverberant frequencies. And when you look using M theory at the sequential process of emergence of the unified field, preparing to assume the role of the Big Bang, there are a series of somersaults. And the initial eight vibrations, superstring has eight fundamental vibrational degrees of freedom. Now, maybe I'll explain that much. Superstring th theory lives in 10 dimensions. One dimension of time, nine dimensions of space. 
So you have strings, thinking very concretely because it helps, moving and vibrating in nine dimensions of space. If you want to ex create a vibration in a string, you strum it. And how many ways can you strum a guitar string? Well, moving the string back and forth this way doesn't produce any sound. It doesn't count. It's not a vibrational mode. But you can string, strum the string down, and it'll vibrate like this. You can pluck the string forward, and it'll vibrate back and forth like this. There are two perpendicular or independent vibrational degrees of freedom of a guitar string in three space. You put the guitar string in nine space, there are eight perpendicular independent degrees of freedom, different ways of strumming the string, giving eight fundamental frequencies. And that is the basic vibrational music symphony of the superstring. But life at the superstring is rich. When you add quantum mechanics to this, an incredible dynamics unfolds that is described in M theory. And the superstring twists itself like a like a pretzel, yogic pretzel process into what is called the heterotic string, which lives in 26 dimensions of unmanifest space, within which the string has 24 vibrational degrees of freedom. And then something really amazing happens. You get rid of all of these embarrassing extra dimensions, which don't exist in the relative universe, by hyper-spooling them, or super-coiling them, like this. Two-dimensional sheet of paper, presto, voila. It's one-dimensional magic. But all I've really done is I've spooled the extra dimension up so that you can't really see it from the back row. It looks like a one-dimensional sheet of paper. Like that, the extra dimensions of space practically disappear, but they're always there on a very fine scale. And super strings wrap themselves around these extra dimensions and can vibrate back and forth along these tubes, giving us extra vibrational tones, extra vibrational degrees of freedom. And what happens is, this 8 plus 24 structure of vibrations of the string in higher dimensions collapses to 64 fermionic and 192 total bosonic degrees of freedom bosonic. in the 3 plus 1 dimensional space in the process of creating the universe. Anyway, there's a definite sequence here and if we had the time to go into it, we could look into the internal vibrational dynamics of consciousness. Not emerging to become mind and body, but reverberating within itself. And this is called Vedic cognition. Just like the Yoga Sutras are to learn how to excite and create the specific vibrational modes of consciousness responsible for the universe, there's something called Karma Mamansa, which is all about learning to fathom in the unmanifest field of consciousness the internal vibrational dynamics of the self, knowing the self. And when you do that, you find the same incredible structure. Mm -hmm.